I want to talk about a night of hope and how you tailor it. Well, first of all, I know you, you, your goal is to make sure people leave feeling inspired. That's right. How? Well, just letting them know that God has a good plan for their life. These nights of hope to me are kind of like rebooting your computer. Sometimes you can have viruses and things that slow you down. So I'm gonna come in here and encourage everybody, see each day as a gift. Let go of the old, the disappointments, the failures, what somebody said, and, and believe that you can still reach your dreams. So it's gonna be a lot through music, through speech. Victoria will tell her story. My mom tells how she overcame cancer. Just a lot of inspiring segments. How do you, or do you tailor it from city to city? I, there are certain par parts that we do. Um, a lot of it is our core key message that goes from city to city, but like my 30 minute message that I'll share here, it's something, I don't know if it was just for this city, but it was just in me for this week. And so I just felt like it was right for here. I'm wondering when you go to, uh, and the reason why I ask that is because right now in Metro Atlanta and really across the country, we're dealing with issues with a lot of tension between police and the community, um, just a, a peak in violence. And it's a lot in, if you're watching the news, if you're reporting the news, for anybody it can sort of drain you to watch your community wherever you live in so much strife. What do you say to the folks who will be coming here from North Georgia, South Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, who are watching the troubles of the nation right now? Yeah, it is, it is a difficult time. Well, our message is about respect, it's about loving one another, it's about taking the high road. And you know, some of these things that we have to show by our examples, that we're going to, to be kind and we're going to love each other. And, and you know, on the same sense, we believe that, you know, we believe in justice, we believe in people being treated right. So I, I guess the overall message is that don't get bitter, don't let it pull you down, get discouraged, stay on that high road. I, I believe that, you know, love always wins, that love overcomes, you know, good overcomes evil. And to, you know, otherwise, I think it just, uh, it can pull you down. I know in some of um, in some of your books, uh, specifically in You Can, You Will, you talk about um, from the beginning, I noticed it was kind of woven through in the beginning and the end, having a passion and being passionate and having a vision. When you are sort of in the muck and mire of life or depression or just basic day-to-day -day struggles, how do you create a vision and then focus? Yeah, I think you have to look in your heart and feel and, and find what you feel like God's put on the inside of you. There's some kind of dream, there's some kind of purpose, whatever it is, it's something to move forward. And, and I think you have to keep that in front of you. Because I do think what you said is true. You get up and you go to work, life can become routine and your dreams get pushed down. But, you know, I believe every day you have to stir up what's on the inside. I think part of it is seeing each day as a gift and knowing that every day you do the right thing, you're passing the test then you trust God to open the right doors. Because sometimes you think, well, I've been doing it for 10 years, Joel, we'll just keep doing the right thing. And I believe at the, at the perfect time, right doors will open. Okay, um, I, you talked about discerning your dream uh, versus discerning God's vision. And I remember you talking specifically about how when you were uh, younger and you were a television production guru and you went for a job and you thought, you, oh, I've got this one, I've got this lined up. And you didn't get it, but not getting it led you to where you are today. So at what point, how do you discern if you're saying, you've got to come up with a dream and a vision, but what if that's not God's will for you? Well, I think you have to follow your passions on the inside. Like I knew I loved television production, editing and all those things. When that door closed, I look back now and realize it led me to my father's church where we, you know, I got all that training and now I'm doing this. So I think you have to trust that God will close uh, you know, God will close the right doors. Sometimes we, you know, we're always believing for the open doors, but the, the closed doors are part of your destiny as well. So, I mean, the longer I live, the more I don't fight what doesn't work out. If that dream didn't come to pass, or I didn't get that one I was hoping for, I just believe it's all a part of God's plan. And so that's a big part of trust. Uh, something else you said that struck me, um, being true to God, uh, how, how God made you and distinguishing yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's true. I think we all have these unique gifts and talents, and it seems like, at least for, I can speak for myself, when, when I took over from my father, I felt like I had to be like my dad, because he'd been there for 40 years. But then one day I realized I'm not exactly like my father, and that's not bad. I love my dad and respect him, but when I stepped into my own gifts of how I minister, maybe not as traditional as my father, but that's where I, I really grew, and I saw God's favor. And so I think it's important to you know, be who God created you to be. You're not in competition with somebody else. And 
I think that takes so much of the pressure off of life. What have you learned about yourself as your ministry has grown that surprised you? Well, I guess the biggest thing is I didn't know this was in me. I didn't think I could get up in front of people. For 17 years, my dad would say, Joel, come up and make the announcements, take the offering, do something. That's, that's not me. I don't know what to say if I get up there. But you know what? This is in me. Now I get to speak to a lot of people. And yet, if you told me 16 years ago, I thought, there's no way. I'm a, I'm, I'm a behind the scenes person. So uh, that's, that surprised me. So what is the lesson then for other folks who are stuck in a box, stuck in a rut, stuck in a pit, as you refer to it? I believe the lesson is you have gifts and talents that you have not yet tapped into. And to keep being your best, uh, believe for these open doors, but, but to know that you have potential that, uh, that's untapped. And then, you know, I think that puts a little bit of more excitement in life to say, well, you know what, I believe something better is in my future. Um, one of my Facebook fans asked me to ask you, what do you say to folks who have lost faith, not just in um, sort of in the spiritual sense, but in just the, the process, going to church, uh, tithing, participating, serving through your church because life has got them in whatever rut they're in. I think that happens to you know a lot of people, probably all of us. So, you know, what I would say to them is that God has you in the palm of his hand. God is not disappointed in you. God's smiling down on you. And I believe sometimes if you just be honest with God, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, God, I feel like I've lost my faith. I believe God will become more and more real. I, I don't think you can get out of God's hands once he's put you in it. So I would just encourage them that there are brighter days up ahead. You talk about something uh, called destination disease and that winners never stop learning and improving. Yeah. What is destination disease? Destination disease is you think, okay, I made it to this level, so I'm good. I'm, I'm teaching at the company or I'm, I'm supervising or whatever it is. I don't think we're ever supposed to stop growing, learning, being better. I mean, I watch every one of my messages and I try to think, how could I do it better? I mean, I don't want to be at the same place next year as I am now. And I think it's easy to get comfortable. But I, I don't, if you're not stretching, I mean, I, I don't think it's a pressure, but if you're not stretching and taking on new things where you have to grow, I think that, uh, you know, you're doing yourself a disservice. What is next for you personally as an individual? Because you, you talk a lot about learning to make yourself happy. You can't make everyone happy. You are doing it. It's working. But what's next for you personally? Well, I think just what we were talking about. I want to keep growing, finding new ways to, to touch people, to inspire them. I want to, I want to be a better father. I want to be a better husband. And so just think um, part of it is just it is the routine of staying healthy physically, spiritually, emotionally. I think a big part of what gets us off sometimes is we're, we're out of balance, you know. You can't work all the time. You have to have time for recreation. You have to have time for church, for God. And so I think it's important to, you know, that's you know, big thing we all face, people that are busy, and most people are busy these days, is that balanced life. And then just a couple of quick questions. One more from Facebook. Someone asked, please ask him, how do you keep your pastors and the leaders of your own church inspired uh, in an appropriate and helpful way? Beyond just the, hey, good job, that was yeah. a good word Sunday. What do you do? You know, what my, do you need? What, what my thing is, um, the way we inspire ours is it's, it's, for, it's through relationships. We do stuff outside the church. You know, we have, have some people over, let's go play basketball, or let's go do something else. I think it's healthy to, to with your key leaders to, to build camaraderie outside of just always the, the, the working environment. Is there anything to just, hey, could you just say hello and not come to me with every one of your problems? I mean, you're still, you're still human. Yeah, and you talk about how it can be draining for anyone to always get the call from the woe is me I've got a lot going on help me out it really is I think you know and I've got a great staff I you know what I think God gives you grace for each season and each time that, that you're in I mean we pray for people at every service and some of them are very overwhelming people that have cancer and man I leave crying more than them but then you gotta you gotta build yourself back up but I don't think on a continual basis that you can have friends that are always pulling you down because it drains you. You need some friends that lift you up as well. Um, one more bigger issue that I wanted to address, this concept of fear, and you've got, we've unfortunately watched some horrible things happening uh, in other countries and here in the name of God by however name people call him. Um, and it is, for some, speaking to a little fear or festering maybe a little fear. What do you say to folks who feel like Christianity or, or your faith from any perspective, if you feel comfortable in that direction, is being 
uh, challenged or tackled and that it is not cool to worship anymore. Yeah, I just think you can't give in to that fear. There's always going to be things coming against us and you know, what's happened overseas and in the world is just, you know, terrible and our hearts go out to those people. But I think you have to live in that place of peace. Again, to God, I believe that, you know, you've got me in the palm of your hand. And I think when you start acting on fear, you just draw in more negativity. I mean, to me, fear is the opposite of faith. You can, you can say, oh, I'm, I'm afraid what's gonna happen. Or you can say, God, I trust that you're in control. So I think it's just really that, that battle takes place in our mind and, you know, fear's a real emotion, but you have to, you know, I think you have to dwell on thoughts of faith and hope and purpose and victory. A parent asked me at school uh, yesterday, Ask him how do you explain tragedy to our young children and help them understand that bad things are going to happen in the world. It's not always God's fault, but sometimes it's God's will. How do you age appropriate that? It's hard. I, I talk with some of the parents, not kids, but parents of the tragedy up in Connecticut there a couple years ago. It's, it's hard. I, I think just what you alluded to is that I would probably say, you know, kids, there are evil forces in the world. God gives us all our own free will, and unfortunately, some people choose to do wrong. And it's not a it's not a perfect world, but uh, you know you have to trust that God's in control of your life. You don't have to live afraid. But uh, you know I believe those people are in heaven with with the Lord.